Brett. Now, before I bring Coach Vermeil on here, Randy Cross said this. He goes, Sills, I saw that you're getting Coach Vermeil on. He goes, ask Coach this, because Randy was on that Rose Bowl team for Coach Vermeil. He goes, Sills, ask him how many times he goes to practice in today's NFL, puts his head down, and goes, no way. 30 minutes of practice. He goes, you know, Sills, you and me went through three days. I went through three days with Ray Perkins. I went, he goes, ask Coach Vermeil that. He goes, he, he would shake his head like this. Let's bring in Coach Vermeil and let's get him on here with us right now. Hey, Coach, practices today in the NFL, 35 minutes. Is that going to cut it with you? Well, it's, you know, 35 minute walkthroughs, but the normal practices are two hours. That's what they're limited to. And, you know, with more coaches, then, you know, for example, I was at Eagles. I had 10 guys. OK, when you divide up 24 guys into coaching, you probably can get a lot more done in two hours than we could get in three hours with 10 guys. But uh, it's different, you know, and, and there's many things really good about it, too. If you, less contact, fewer bangs to the head, you know, fewer knee injuries, maybe in these kinds of things. So that's all benefits the player and the game has remained very exciting. So. It hadn't hurt the game that much. So as an old critical coach, you look at the fundamentals, sometimes you say, wow, it's not like it used to be. Absolutely. Coach, well, let me say this, though. When you have a lot of new faces come into an organization, it, like it looks like the Eagles have made with free agency so far, mm -hmm. and you're limited in practice time, especially when you're an old lineman, you know that the skill set on that side of the ball takes a little more time. Mm -hmm. Or when you're talking about routes, and then you got new coordinators, do you think that's going to be more of a process for those guys to have to go through and making the offseason more of a priority than they have in the past because you've got a lot of new faces? Yeah, well, you know, speaking of Philadelphia, definitely, because you'll remember last year uh, they were very confident the kind of team they had, and they didn't think they needed as much work, and they cut the OTAs from 12 to 6 and didn't even have a mini camp. So there's uh, six practices there, and, and – and two a day, three, uh, that's uh, 12 practice sessions. I think they'll probably utilize those this year. You know, it's just, you know, you go through things. Sometimes you do things as a coach, you make a mistake. Next year, you don't do it again. You change. And, uh, you know, simply, something definitely went wrong last year. And so that I, I'm sure that Nick, the caliber coach he is, and now his staff have been reorganized a little bit. They'll straighten some things out. Coach, um, I heard you last year on WIP when you were talking about Jalen Hurts, and I, I, I completely agreed with you when you said that, hey, coach, when he's in that RPO and you're a defensive guy and you watch that guy on third and 11, and he just breaks the defensive coordinator's back when he picks that up. And then when they seemingly take that away from him, I think it makes him less dynamic. And you're trying to turn him into a passer and you're taking one of the elements away from him. Do you agree, Coach, that they should run him as much as they did in the past to help his passing game and his passing routes? Or do you like the way that they're developing him now? Because, Coach, he did take a step back last year. Well, I, you know, first off, I don't think he has any limitations. I think you can do what you want to do with him. I would I would probably have a design run or two and a, a limited number of RPOs and uh, try to run him uh, maybe more efficiently then maybe less or more and uh, definitely do not ever remove the, the scramble run, especially against the man coverages and that kind of stuff, because then he controls the amount of man coverage they play by his ability to run. And that scares the coordinators to death, as you know. And, uh, but I would definitely have a run or two, maybe three or four that I could call and, and think he's going to be able to take care of himself uh, upon contact and, and but also make a lot of yards in the design run. Yeah. Coach, I had Keith Byers on the other day, and he said something about the team. By the way, Mike Quick's going to join us. I'll make sure I say hi to him for you. He'd be on at 530. Um, he, he, Keith said this. He goes, after Thanksgiving, they didn't play championship football because they weren't spreading the ball around. And now when you have Saquon Barkley, Coach, I think one of the biggest questions about Barkley, how are you going to utilize him? Because are you going to give him 20, 25 touches? Are you going to know that a player who's had injury issues in his past? Again, New York hasn't had a lot of talent. There's a ton of talent in Philadelphia. But, Coach, how would you use Saquon Barkley to be implemented? Because there's a lot of mouths to feed in that offense. Often. 
<laughs> would he be? Would the offense run through him? He has no team? value sitting on the bench. No <laughs> and, you know, I used to do that, you know, with Wilbert Montgomery. And when I saw him standing beside me on the sideline, I said, "I'm in second gear." And not that the other kids couldn't play, but they couldn't make the explosive play that he might make on the next play. So I would make sure that he touches the ball in run and pass game, probably try to around 25 times a game. You're like a Marshall Falk type guy. Uh, there is He has no limitation. Now you have two guys in the backfield have no limitation. You've got two wide receivers that have very little, if any, limitation. you got an offensive line that's outstanding and well coached. You've got a hell of an offensive football team. <laughs> I'll tell you, as soon as you take one of those guys out, you, you drop a little bit in the, the ability to make that one big explosive play that he might make. You know, I would like to see him run the ball a minimum of 20 times a game. That's me. You know, and all the great runners, if you go into NFL records and study, you know, the, the Dallas Cowboy running backs, the Eric Dickersons and all these kind of guys, the so Walter Payton's, they carry the ball often. And they, they weren't too concerned about how many guys were in the box. You know, they just called running plays and allowed that guy to, to run the football. They're the leading rushers in the history of the league, those guys. And I think you've got to be careful that you don't overprotect your, your running back. You know, Coach, I used to get Mike Martz on my program when I was doing radio in Southern California because he lives in SoCal. And I asked him, I go, man, when you're trying to get all those great wideouts and Kurt, he goes, no, no, no. Coach Vermeil's offense and our offense went through Marshall Falk. It started there. It ended there. Our offense was fueled by that guy. Everyone else profited off of what Marshall did. Would you, Would you? if, if that's you, are you saying to use Saquon kind of the same way that you and Mike used uh, Marshall Falk in that offense? I would, you know, and Mike was just, Mike Martz, of course, speaking of, was just outstanding. That was his first job as an offensive coordinator, believe it or not. Oh, you wow. Know? Yeah. He had been an offensive coordinator in college. That's where I met him. But, uh, you, know, uh, you know, when you have that guy in the backfield that can tie up the linebackers in the running game and passing game, and, and try to force people to bring those safeties up in there to stop the run, you, you, your wide receivers are going to be more explosive. But it, it's a cat and mouse game, you know. And I think the offenses today are so much more sophisticated than, say, my Eagle offense, you know. It, it, there's no comparison. You're comparing our 1980 Super Bowl team offense, which was a good one, and uh, – uh, I would say it's like comparing a 1980 Cadillac with a 2024 Cadillac. There's a lot more to them today. You know, more <laughs> technology, more people teaching, and people over the years have learned how to keep improving schemes. And, uh, you know, just look at Andy Reid. Who's doing it any better? He wasn't doing it as well in 1980 as he is now because the scheme keeps maturing and technically sounder, and they start coaching things in this direction and eliminate this because they never got any production out of it. And it's just, just, it's fascinating to watch. I really enjoy watching the offensive game today. It's amazing. Yeah. Coach, you mentioned Andy and I, one of my questions was going to be, do you believe that you were a better coach in St. Louis than you were in Philly because of the experience that you got in Philadelphia on the things you did right? And maybe some of the things you'd like to have changed were you a better coach in St. Louis? No, no. Uh, you know, experience only helps you after you needed it. Okay. <laughs> that. But, you know, because I, I was young and I was running my own offense, coaching my own quarterbacks. I had Sid Gilman working with them on the field, but I ran the quarterback meetings and the, uh, off the, the offensive coordinator meetings and the team meetings. I was it, totally involved. But being out of it for 14 years, Coming back into it with the Rams, I did a better job of the overall organization. In in every department, I was involved. Whereas a head coach, uh, of course, there weren't as many departments in the old days either. But when you're more zeroed in on the football X's and O's, it's actually more fun. Sometimes you can, you, when you're the general of the organization, sometimes you feel a little left out. You know, <laughs> you know, and uh, you're able to make a contribution, but not like you were when you were young running the whole thing it's run the whole show it's not quite as much fun it's very rewarding now you end up with a team like st louis 
you got four guys on offense that are already in the Hall of Fame. Okay, four of them. And you got one more coming in Tory Holt. So, you know, you, uh, my staff did a beautiful job led by Mark Martz, especially that Super Bowl year. So would you say, Coach, you enjoyed coaching more in Philly and you became a better delegator in, L- in uh, St. Louis? Oh, no question. Yeah. The actual coaching of the zero X's and O's and that kind of stuff. No question. Hey, coming from UCLA, myself and Rod Dowhauer running the offense there with Terry Donahue uh, and then winning the Rose Bowl and I'm calling every play in that game. And all of a sudden you're standing on the sideline listening to what somebody else's call. Yes, you sit in in the meetings. But it's you can't add your impulses and all those kind of things. And the, the gut feelings you get from time to time is when it's running like that and you're just standing listening. It's different. It's different. A lot of people do it that way. In fact, probably more do it that way today than ever before. Andy Reid still runs his offense and still calls his own plays. And I think he spent a little time not doing that, let somebody else call it. But uh, it's a little more fun. You, because you feel a little more attached, you know, it's, you know, it's anyway, that's how I felt. You know, coach, um, it's funny. You, you, you talk about UCLA and, you know, when coach Johnson, my coach in college and in the pros, when, when, when he went from the college game to the Cowboys, he, he had a conviction. And I think like you no, we're going to even one in 15 coach, he was like this. No, we're going to play to 43. We're going to do this. We're going to do it this way. We're going to die on the vine with it, or we're or or we're going to succeed. Is it important, like for a guy like Jim Harbaugh too, that you have that same kind of conviction? And I'm not saying you don't you don't wobble your 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 views when someone's giving you something else. But how important was that for you making that transition by sticking with your your thought process on what did you wanted to see the Eagles look like? Because you're coming from the college game to the pros. That's a different. That's a whole different animal. Yeah. How hard or how easy was that for you? Well, you know, I had been an assistant coach in the NFL. Right. I was an offensive coordinator with the Rams in 71 and 72. Then I stayed there with Chuck Knox, and I was a run, uh, back, running back coach and special teams coach. So I'd been in there, and i have been there. But when I left UCLA, I brought basically spring practice-type practice schedules to training camp. Okay. So we were consistently working on the fundamentals of the game because we knew we didn't have any draft choices. And we felt if we did that, we could improve the players that we have. And then we gradually add more talent to it. And when we started adding more talent, some of our players that weren't as talented became very fine players because of working on the fundamentals of the game all the time. Now the player coaches don't get as much time to work on fundamentals. It really shows an offensive line play. I don't know an offensive line coach right now that does coach within a frustrated mind, that he just doesn't have enough time to really develop kids, develop them. And you, our old thought was we would never draft an offensive lineman in the first round unless he was predicted a Hall of Famer. Orlando Pace. Unusual, unusual, unusual but you would pick a guy in the second, third round because you could coach him in time to be a a first round quality player. Harder to do today. And I feel sorry for the coaches in that regard. It's harder to do. Jimmy Johnson is a great example. You talk about the football coach. I'm a big admirer of his because I I know players that played for him, you know, and uh, I don't know him personally well. I know him, know him, but I don't know him personally one-on-one a lot, but, uh, uh, they coach football, okay? They, they coach the fundamentals of the game. Our offenses weren't that sophisticated. They're very good, very structured, very disciplined, and fundamentally sound. You know, it's funny, Coach. I feel the same talking to you as I do when I – You know, and you know what's crazy? Because many people I know who have played for you, my coach to this day, 35 years removed from me playing for him, he's the same guy when I was 19 years old that when I am right now, he never changed. He just loves me and it's great. And when I saw you inducted into the hall of fame, his notion was it was a great reward for all of us. And it was about the players, the assistants was about all the people that he enjoyed being around to get and all the hard work it paid off. And it just, is that kind of how you felt coach when you went in that 
Uh-oh. It was more about the assistants, all the players and all the things, the equipment managers, UCLA. Uh, yeah. Wait, San Mateo High School when you're there. All of that, right, Coach? Six of, of my star- six of my starters were at the Hall of Fame. Okay. No, really, Dan, you made a statement a minute ago. I'm going to back you up on it. You said I played for him. I played for Coach. Yeah. You know, some I gradually learned what an unbelievable responsibility that is. That's a hell of a responsibility. Because, Coach, you know, it's I, blind, I hear it all the time blind, here. Coach, yeah. it's blind faith in you. Yeah. You have to have blind faith that you're yeah. you're telling me something yeah. well, that I'm going, know. I don't know what the success is going to be. And yeah. when you feel it and see it, you're like this. Yeah. I went to national championships at Miami, one yeah. of them with him. And I'm like, wow, it works. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you played at Miami, you played for the coach. Okay. And I've heard that so many times that every time I heard it, it deepened my responsibility and sense of responsibility for what I was as a coach and for what I was in relationship to my players. Coach, I w- I've always wanted to ask you this. You know, I, I asked Mike Martz this question, and I, and I want to see if you, if, you, if, if you echo it. I said, Mike, when you're making that decision when Trent Green goes down and nobody in the room wanted to do it, and his assistant coaches were like, no, no we got to trade, we got to make – he goes, Dick is the only guy or one of the only guys in the room that just went like this. No, there's something about that. Coach, that's not analytics. That's not anything for a guy who's been cut six times or whatever he was, putting ketchup on a shelf in a grocery store. You're sitting there and you're looking at a kid. Where does that come from, Coach, where you just go, no, I'm, I'm going to put my entire – Coaching faith in this guy with the Rams here. I'm going with him. It was a Hall of Fame decision, Coach. Well, we all we all were involved in the decision. When you're a head coach, you're at the final decision. And Mike was deeply involved in the overall evaluation. And, and, and like Mike said, we could look all over. I can't right now. I can't name somebody that's automatically going to come in and be what Trent Green was. But we have a guy here in the offense that was here last year. Now he's in our offense now and in our training camp now, and he's looked pretty good on the practice field. I liked him from the year before when he was our third quarterback and he was running our scout team offense against our defense. I used to walk off the field. I'd say to Peter Junta and John Bunning, our our coordinators, I'd say, guys, either this kid can play or our defense is lousy. because He just picks (laughs) us apart, you know? So, you know, sometimes you have a tendency to say, oh, yes, practice. And he's run the car, plays off the car. That won't happen game day. You know, sometimes that doesn't happen game day. But we were fortunate. He got better as soon as he started playing games. He got better. And there are guys like that. And I've been very, very fortunate with my quarterback situations, okay, in my entire career. My high school quarterback was all-conference. My JC quarterback was all-conference. My college quarterback was an All-American, you know. (laughs) John Shara. John Shara, yeah. Ron Ron Jaworski becomes an All-Pro, and Kurt Warner becomes a – Hall of Famer, Trent Green, makes all pro later. So uh, sometimes it's a hunch. And every once in a while, I pat myself on the back. And I said, you know, something always directs me in the right direction. And I can't really pinpoint it. But it's usually just an overall gut feeling about this guy. And going on what you see. You think it's football intuition, Coach? I think part of it, yeah. And uh, you know, I think that there are people that are more instinctively uh, better leaders. And it, it's not a program thought. It just it comes to them. And these are the things we have to do. And it, it, it's not a response you write down before you say it. It's now as you make it, you know. And uh, uh, I, I was fortunate many times in making critical decisions. You know, hiring coaches, you know, many coaches get fired because they hired the wrong guys. You know, give, you, you can't do it all yourself. But, uh, no, you know, as you get older, you, you realize as a head coach, you better know the main things. You better coach, know Jimmy, the main Co- things. Okay. coach Jimmy Johnson told me, Coach, that every head coach, if you don't have the quality assistant coaches around them, yeah. and especially an offensive line coach, not a chance in hell you're going to be successful because no you can't do it alone. And if yeah. you don't have that assistant coaching staff, 
And maybe that's one of the reasons the Eagles had a bumpy ride last year is because of the inexperience. And I'm not throwing any shade on Sean Desai or Brian Johnson, but when you're in a position where you're this close to being a Super Bowl champion, experience matters in that game, don't you think? Oh, yeah. 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 But, you know, like I said, Mike Marsh didn't have any NFL coordinator experience either. But, you know, just, just have a hunch who's the right guy. And uh, something went wrong last year, okay? Some, they, they were not the same now. They lost an offensive coordinator and they lost a defensive coordinator. Maybe those guys were making outstanding contributions. And when it changes and the other people aren't experienced or aren't the same quality, especially under pressure, especially in planning what we're going to do with the ball Sunday, it affects the quarterback more than any other position. Two last questions for you, coach. I'd like to get your, you think coach, you think coaching someone like Pat Mahomes is easy or hard? Well, I think, I think, I don't know, think there's anything easy in coaching. Okay. I don't think it's easy. And I don't think you mean it when, when you say easy, uh, you have no limitation on what you ask him to do. You, 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 you as a coach, you say, well, we can't do that because he can't do this. He can't throw this kind of ball. He can't do, we can't get in these multiple formations because he ha can't handle a complexity. He can't read the defense. So he like, I, I say this about Jim Hurts. He has no, as far as I'm concerned, I will, I go to practice once a year. So I'm not an expert on it, but I watch him play. He has no limitations. Mahomes has no limitations and he gets to prove it every week because he hasn't lost his offensive coordinator. <laughs> That's the right. same guy. He's got the same guy, and and they, and they grow together. They grow together. But uh, Mahomes is going to go down as probably the finest ever. Right now, yeah, Tom Brady's the finest ever. Yeah. Have but, you watched the uh, Have you watched the uh, the show Dynasty? Yes. Outstanding. It was an outstanding. I loved every minute. I didn't realize Bill Chick was so tough. But uh, I, I'm glad he was because he won six Super Bowls being that way. I wish I could have been tougher. How about this, Coach? Um, Coach Johnson says that during the time every year he'd come down to Isle Murata where Coach Johnson lives, and they would talk about uh, coaching. And he said that this is what him and Brady did. You know, the relationship at times was contentious, but there was massive respect. And the only thing those guys would sit around doing for hours, besides the practice field time, was that they would do situational football and they would sit there and go like this. And Bill would go, what are you going to do? Third and six minus 20, uh, 14, uh, 14 uh, 12 minutes left in the half mm -hmm. one time out. And then Tom would have to come up. He'd fire something out. I'm bringing a blitz here. And that's all those guys were doing. They were going back and forth and playing like war games. Mm -hmm. And he was schooling him on when it came to situational uh, play calling, because as you know, coach, Mahomes is the most talented kid in Aaron Rodgers. They're way more super skilled than what Brady is, but Brady's a savant in that huddle. Yeah, I mean, he just other, knows pre-call snaps. Yeah, yeah, but the variable of under pressure football, the variables, and not everybody handles the variables as well. And nobody has ever handled the variable variables any better than Tom Brady. And more consistently, Joe Montana, maybe. Yeah. yeah it's in the same thing. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's just when you watch him play, and I coached against him enough the times, especially when I was with the Chiefs, and you watch him play and what he does, uh, he's amazing. Absolutely. He's amazing. Yeah. Coach, finally, do you like the state of the game right now? These new, now I'm a defender. These new, like, you know, now you can't do the hip drop tackle and, I'm telling you, Coach, pretty soon we're going to have flags on these guys yeah, and we're going to be playing flag football. I mean, I don't know if Lawrence Taylor or Reggie White or any of these guys could play in today's game because the game, in my opinion, was way more physical. And to your point, Coach, hey, look, CTE, you've got to, you've got to be careful with that. It was not as looked at back then. No one knew what was going on with the right. helmets and all that. I get it. But, I mean, Coach, you got it. We still got to be a football game. You don't want to hurt the integrity of the sport. Well, you know, I'm old enough. I've coached some guys that have already passed away. Then when their brains were checked out, they had CTE. And I, every one of them said to me prior to passing on 
they wouldn't change one thing in regard to their football careers. They would play the game. Me too. Yeah, and I think it's smart as hell to keep trying to make it safer for the player, but you've got to be careful that you don't, in trying to make it safer, you lose what the game is all about and what made it a great game. You know, these guys uh, play football because they like to, and then they, yeah, obviously, even today, now they're making a lot of money, and that's great. I'm happy for them coaches as well but uh i just think uh they know the risk they're taking to play the game they don't have to play it's not a state law if you're in louisiana you have to play football uh, for the miami dolphins and hey coach it's not a draft you have to show up for <laughs> yeah, right. you, you do it because you want it when you just like yeah i grew up around auto racing okay just like race drivers when it used to be really dangerous i mean really dangerous they knew what they were getting in for so I, uh, but I think to summer up, summarize what I'm saying, I think any move you can make that might save somebody from getting hurt is a good move. And there, but there's a point um, where officiating gets in and it gets, it, it, the, the officiating can become a distraction to the game, you know, but I'm glad that what they're doing with the kickoff return, they, they put that back in the game. And I think it's going to be a, a benefit. But the game overall to sit down and watch is a better game than it's ever been because there's more things happen exciting, you know, and uh, I enjoy, I really enjoy watching it. And I just, uh, I'm envious of the quality of some of these coaches in the National Football League. I mind they're doing wonderful jobs. Coach, it's been awesome, but I do have to ask one last thing here. Eagles, St. Louis, or Kansas City, what was your favorite stopping grounds? Well, you know, I'd have to say Philadelphia because I live here. You know, my grandchildren were born here. My kids finished their education here, got married here. Was uh, it because so it was your first choice? Was it because it was your first opportunity? Yeah, and I was I was deeply involved in everything. Yeah, and, and not that you're when you don't run your own offense, you're not deeply involved. But I mean, it's just every minute. Uh, so that uh, Kansas City was. Uh, and St. Louis, but Kansas City even more so was every bit as fat, passionate as Philadelphia, not quite as intense. <laughs> you, know, you could lose a tough game in Kansas City, walk out the tunnel, and someone would say, That's all right, coach, we'll get him next week. Good job. I didn't hear that many times. <laughs> which which you respect. You know, I respect their their deep, intense emotional feelings toward the Eagles team. I don't think it's quite as bad as it used to be or as good as it used to be. Because I think when they had to buy seating licenses and all that, there are a lot of people who couldn't buy those tickets to buy the seat, you know. But anyway, uh, the passion here, I mean, it's what's embarrassed. Sometimes I'm embarrassed. I walk down the street in Philadelphia and there's some lady with silver hair like mine walk up and say, Coach, she's, oh, well, boy, you were this and that. I love your team, that Wilbert Monk, that Bill Berge, that Ron Joy. You know, it just fills me up. It really does. Yeah. Absolutely, Coach. I think you really put the stamp on the rivalry between the Eagles and the Cowboys. And still to this day, I think it was you that fueled that thing. So, Coach, thank you for all your time. I mean, you know, uh, you are I was so happy to see you get into the Hall of Fame and you know, Don Coriel's family, I knew very well. I was happy that he eventually got in. I thought it was long overdue you getting into the Hall of Fame for the turnarounds that you had. I talked to many people like Jared Bell. I'm like, okay, hey, look at where he was. The Eagles stunk. I mean, <laughs> St. Louis stunk. <laughs> I mean, he, these were all turnaround programs that coach walks in and turns very around. So. Very fortunate. And, you know, I feel I'm very grateful for the contribution everybody made. I'm going to feel better when Tom Coughlin goes in. I'm going to feel better when Shanahan goes in. I'm going to go feel better when Mike uh, Holmgren goes in. You know, hey, how about Dan Reeves? God, how many wins do you need? Two Super Bowls. Plus, co plus coach, the playing time that he had with how Dallas. About, yeah. Been in nine about, Super Bowls. Marty Schottenheimer. These guys. 206 wins, coach. Yeah. And you know what? He's the, I think he, I, I make a call. My, my cousin, Dave Pizzuli played for him in Cleveland and Dave goes, this guy's got 206 wins. He's fifth all time. And he's not anyone's considering because he's five and 14 in the postseason. I'm like, you ever see John Madden's record in the postseason? He's nine and eight. Yeah. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, we're talking about what a guy did 
with his career. I don't think he ever had a losing season in his 24 years coaching. Yeah. Well, how, yeah. How about Chuck Knox? Took three Another different guy. Teams, three different teams that all three of them were losing, and took them to the playoffs. Okay. Yeah. Yes, he'd never gotten a Super Bowl, but we got to be careful. You know, we got to be careful using that as the only two, or the number one tool. Uh, to evaluate whether a coach is a Hall of Fame coach. So, Coach, you think the regular season matters oh, more than the postseason? The overall, I do. You got to, you know, I know. I'll tell you this. I was at the Rams in 1972. Is that George Allen? No, it's uh, Tommy Prothero. Oh, a Tommy Prothero. Okay. I think we won seven games. Chuck Knock comes there the next year. He keeps me and Tom Catlin on the staff. And we won. Uh, at that time, we were only playing 14. I think we were 12 and 2. Okay. And we were won 10 or 11 straight. You know? Uh, yeah, and look, at, he did it. At, 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 at shit, in Baltimore wouldn't have Yeah, good. yeah, yeah. And then he goes to Seattle, you know? Yeah. But uh, – uh, but because the playoff record with he and, and Marty is not great, it's it, – Anyway, I don't buy it. You know, I'll tell you this. Shanahan, anyone coach against Shanahan team knows he's a Hall of Fame football coach. Anyone knows that Mike Kyle. Holmes, Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they know they're uh, Hall of Fame coaches. That, uh, Mike Shanahan, unbelievable. Football. Coach, let me, throw some, let me throw some modern day coaches at you. What do you think of Mike Tomlin? I think he's a, a very, very fine football coach. I, I've never worked with him. In that, uh, but, uh, but, but coach, he's not really a hands-on play calling guy. He's more matter. of an administrative oh, that, guy. That doesn't matter. I mean, he's done a hell of a job. He's done a hell of a job. Uh, nobody has ever gone to Pittsburgh and failed. I'll tell you, that's one advantage. How about this, coach? They have three. They've had three coaches since 1969. There's been more popes and yeah. presidents in the United States, and more and more popes in Rome than yeah. in Pittsburgh. They've only had three coaches. No. Cower and Tomlin since 1969. That's the last time they put a guy on the moon yeah. was when they had the when they put Coach Noll in there. I mean, I think it's the most consistent thing I've ever seen in my life in the NFL is that there's only been three coaches since 69. Great That's organization, crazy. and Tomlin will be in the Hall of Fame. He will end up in the Hall of Fame deservingly. You know, who's 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 coaches like he has now? Nobody. No one's lasting as long as he has lasted. You know, what do you think of Sean McVay, Coach? Co Sean McVay reminds me kind of he's, of you. He's, he's going that direction. John McVay's going that direction. Kyle Shanahan. My God. he's They're going in that direction. Yeah. Is Mike Shanahan That's, a Hall of Fame coach? Mike Shanahan? Oh, no question. Absolutely no no question. Now, he's won two Super Bowls. Yeah. Okay. He's won two Super Bowls. You know, just uh, he's a great football coach. And he was, you know, he worked for Bill Walsh. So Bill yeah. was pretty good at, you know, Mike Holmgren and those kind of guys. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Coach, it's been an honor. All Thank right. you. I hope you do it again. You're absolutely right, awesome. You, you know where I am. I, I'll be on time next time. Take care. It's all good. Thank you, Coach. I appreciate right. it. Thank you, Take sir. Care. You got it. The legendary Dick Vermeil. Appreciate him doing that for me and spending so much time with me. Awesome. Hey, don't forget, March Madness, our friends at Underdog Fantasy. Time to sign up here with our loyal viewers and subscribers. Tell me that was an awesome talking to Coach. I think that's the first time we've had Coach Vermeil on the program. And by the way, okay, 10 bucks, they match it. 20 bucks, they match it. March Madness Tournament, without a doubt, during this whole entire time. By the way, Thursday, it starts to tip off again. And for you to be able to be involved, the code word is, the promo code is WINS, W-I-N. That's W-I-N. Hit the like button. Don't forget, Mike Quick will also join us at 530 Eastern. We'll reset. Keep it here, National Football Show.